What we see, and like your uh, comment on that. Is everybody okay over there? Yes. Is that gentleman fine? Yeah, fine. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> as long as you're okay. I usually can't sit that long. I shouldn't have sat that long this time. I apologize. No, no problem. Let, let, me, let me answer that in the context of what this gentleman was saying over here. Because, you know, these, these battles that you're talking about, CSA, Pat, and other stuff, they're, they're important battles, obviously, but they're just short-term battles. I mean, you win here, they're going to pop up over here. You win here, they're going to pop up over here. And that's why what I was talking about in my talk is in the context of what you're suggesting, is that not only do we have to think in terms of the short-term, winning these little battles here, or that are important battles, we got to be thinking in terms of pulling that root out entirely. Uh, what's the justification for the TSA pat downs? It's the terrorism. Where is the terrorism coming from? It's because of what this military industrial complex, the national security state, the CIA, is doing to people overseas. If you dismantle that, you dismantle the anger and the hatred, you get rid of the terrorist threat, you don't need the pat downs anymore. And that's the only long-term solution to this. Uh, that's why that focus has got to be not only on the short term, it's got to be on the long term as well, because otherwise you can spend the rest of your life fighting these little brush fires. When you really, the really the solution is, is to hit the big paradigm, a big paradigm shift to a constitutional republic from this empire that, that Bruce was talking See, and, and, and what I, my observation is, what surely is the military industrial complex that fuels and banks uh, to some degree that that gives force to the projection of the military abroad uh, permanently. But that's not the only uh, fuel here. Because you can go back to the beginning of our uh, transformation from a public to an empire to the Mexican-American War. There weren't huge banks at that time, no city bank. It wasn't any military industrial complex. It was an intellectual transformation. You know, the idea of manifest destiny. God just made us the perfect DNA genes and we were unlike any other people in the history of the world. We didn't have any temptations. You know, we were all born to be saints and to get to heaven really fast. Uh, and that, there's that mentality, uh, which was the opposite of the founding fathers' mentality, which is one of humility. You know, we are. They always reminded themselves we have to make proper deductions for the ordinary depravity very eloquent phrase. Whenever they were drafting an institution that they were trusting with power, we have to make deductions for the ordinary depravity of human nature. And it's with the manifest destiny, even before the military industrial complex, that got the United States in the position of fighting what I call purposeless, objectless, war, objectless wars. Wars for the sake of war. Now, this idea that Mexico was going to invade the United States or France or Great Britain was going to put monarchy there was preposterous. And even someone like Ulysses Grant, who was, was not squeamish, as you know, about killing, he was involved in the Mexican-American War. In his memoirs, he wrote it was the most squalid, unjustified war in the history of the United States. That's the beginning. The military-industrial context comes and exploits this tendency of empire to fight and expand for its own sake. And it goes, in my judgment, to a very primal instinct human nature that has to be domesticated because lots of humans get a thrill of gratification about thinking they're number one, like you know, being on the Super Bowl team or something <laughs> like that. Oh, if we can just dominate other people, we should be proud. And you even found that in Obama's last State of the Union message, right? Hey, those who think the United States has fallen down on the hierarchy of greatness in the world, they're all wrong. We're at the top and the pinnacle. So don't, don't write us off. You know, we can vaporize bin Laden and vaporize little kids there, so you ought to respect us. <laughs> and it is this very, very juvenile motivation that continues to give impetus to these purposeless, objectless wars. And it's not just the United States, all empires do that. When the Soviet Union general, after he was, they were evicted from Afghanistan, was asked, well, why did you invade in December 1979? There was no answer. We just did. Lack of anything better to do. And it was the beginning of the end of the Soviet Empire. And we ultimately will follow that same fate unless we recoil from the cliff of domination. All right, let's try to take a few more questions. All right, we've got a couple people back there. Well, here we go. 
Just one quick one. Thank you guys for coming tonight. For stuff. Um, you guys talked a lot tonight, tonight about the NDAA Act, and I'm really glad you guys mentioned that, because I feel the media has hardly mentioned that. Rather, they've concentrated a lot on SOPA and PIPA, which are both also threats to our liberty. Um, do you think there's a certain reason why they concentrated more on SOPA and PIPA as opposed to the NDAA Act? Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think that people thought and think that SOPA, I mean, the of SOPA was some huge victory for citizen activism or something, or some kind of like testament to the ongoing purity of democracy. Um, and it was a little bit inspiring in its own way, um, although it's not really a victory in that it's just being retooled and it's coming back. Um, for sure, these, these, these defeats of lobbyists don't ever, they're not really permanent, they're kind of like zombies, they just yeah. <laughs> you know, continuously get back up again. Um, but if you look at what actually happened with SOPA, and the reason why it got so much attention is because on the one hand, you had an extremely powerful lobbying interest, which is the entertainment industry agitating for its enactment. Um, and on the other side, you didn't only have a bunch of scrappy citizens kind of yeah. fighting against it, you also had an equally, in fact, even a more powerful lobbyist interest, Silicon Valley, um, that wanted it to be defeated. Um, and so the reason it got so much attention is because there was an extraordinarily powerful force that was opposing it as well that had an incredibly powerful uh, platform to bring attention to it. Um, and it was really kind of the like arrival of Silicon Valley as the preeminent lobbying force in Washington that actually defeated the once, um, you know, undefeated entertainment industry. Uh, so, you know, it is a victory in some sense in that it got temporarily defeated. Um, but the broader fight there is a fight that I think is probably the most important one, which is a fight over internet freedom. Mm -hmm. And the reason is is that internet freedom is really the weapon that can change all of the dynamics of what we were just discussing. Uh, because it enables citizen voices to be amplified and for citizens to find one another without relying on large corporations mm -hmm. um, or any large institutions. It's extremely organic and therefore can be limitless in all sorts of ways. And of course, you saw the potential of it in the Arab Spring. You've seen it in all kinds of movements um, in the United States as well. Um, the way in which technology, I mean, I know that I, I, I bet the president of the Americans for Liberty on Monday night or in, in New York, and he mentioned to me that I was asking him when the group was formed, and he said it actually formed out of the Ron Paul campaign in 2008. I was shocked that an organization of this scope and this size and this influence that I see everywhere I turn um, is only three years old. Um, yeah. And the reason that was able to happen, I think you mentioned that it's actually bigger than Young Americans for Freedom has ever been, or maybe yeah, you were the one telling that, is because the internet has enabled this accelerated activism. Um, and it enables people to challenge even the seemingly most entrenched power. So whenever anyone says, you know, what can we do about these things, it all seems sort of gloomy. Um, the answer is that you continue to communicate with one another um, and to your fellow citizens. The internet enables those voices to be amplified. And that's the reason why every tyranny, every power faction, including the United States, is extremely focused on developing tools to limit and constrain internet freedom and to be able to control the internet. Um, that's what the sober fight is about, but that's just one small part of it. There's an international convention, ACTA, that's even more insidious um, in terms of vesting government control over the internet. Um, and so this is really the fight that is at the forefront of everything that we're discussing tonight. The defeat of SOPA was good, but it shouldn't be understood as, as something other than, than what it was. And the reason it got so much attention is because um, there was a big industry that wanted a good Cool, thank you. The, the biggest difference is one word, money. That's that, though. Yeah.